Is it yes, they did. Yeah. They did, especially your father Fidian, who used mm. to teach us English. Right. And he was a stickler, you know, for proper grammar and all those kind of things. Yeah. If you say, Father, can I leave the room? He said, you can, but you may not. <laughs> And we had very good teachers yeah. in maths and yeah. uh, humanities. Mm. Our education was more, you know, arts-oriented than science. Right. We didn't have a well-equipped lab. Mm. But then boarding life was the ideal preparation for life. I feel, you know, it has made a man out of me. Yeah. Well, you're certainly there for some very formative years. Yes. Uh, it was tough. Because mm. although there was no discrimination in the school, in mm -hmm. the classroom, on the playground. Mm -hmm. But in the dining hall there was. Mm -hmm. We had these, you know, three different classes of boarders. Yeah. We had the parlor boarders. Mm -hmm. uh, they had two extra dishes and a dessert. Mm -hmm. And uh, the second class boarders had an extra dish. And you can imagine us third class boarders, mostly Anglo-Indians, <laughs> with our tongues hanging out. <laughs> <laughs> Mouths watering. Yeah. Uh, there were times, you know, when we did feel homesick, yeah. hungry. Mm. But still, I say those were the days I was happy then. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I tell some people I was a half starved, third class boarder, and I was happy. Oh, well, that's good. <laughs> that's very good. And the separation from family. Uh, you were away for many, many months at a, at a stretch, but it must have made returning home after that time. Yeah, that's right. Glorious was, you know, we were out nine months in the year, uh, one and a half months uh, summer holidays and one and a half months Christmas holidays we were at home, back home. Mm. And we really look forward to, you know, getting into that homebound train. Yeah. Yep. Yes, we did. Yeah. And then uh, when you went back home, mm -hmm. Uh, you were thoroughly spoiled because mom used to make everything that you wanted, you know, because yeah. just... Uh, yeah. Totally. Well, it sounds like it hasn't harmed you at all. Because, I mean, you're, you're well-spoken, you, you know, you've, you've had uh, a good career, you're articulate, and, you know, you're right, so... I think it's done me good, it's done, done me a lot of good, really. Yeah, yeah. interesting. So, what age were you when you first started work then? Well, I came out of school... Uh, at the age of 14, so I was too young. Mm. You know, this is the result of getting a double promotion when I was in the railway right. school. Thank God they don't uh, double promote you now, mm -hmm. because I was too young for a job, even an apprenticeship, right. and uh, there was no family means to study higher. Right. So I when you say to, sorry to interrupt, when you say family means, do you mean it, it was expensive? Yes, it was. There was only one college in Vizag. Right. And it's only the you know elite, the top draw is to go there. Uh, Anglo Indians? Not affordable. No, very few Anglo Indians. Right. Except you know Anglo Indians who at that time mm -hmm. were working in good posts in the shipyard in the merchant navy. Oh, those right. guys used to go. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So then you started work? So I started working at the age of seventeen. Seventeen, yeah. It was an apprenticeship. Yeah. First at Kurza Road and then later at Mm. Jamalpo, which was a good mm. institution, oh, right. a five-year apprenticeship right. course. Yes, and that was in uh, what train building, engineering, or maintenance? Well, it was in uh, mechanical, engineering. mechanical engineering. It was equivalent to a diploma in mechanical engineering. Right. Yeah. And uh, that institution is now called the Indian Railways Institute of Mechanical and Electrical Engineering. Right. Okay. At Jamalpo. So it's perpetuated. In Yes, it's still a good, still training, still good training institution. Yeah. So, your career then, you retired in 1999. Tell That's us what right. it was like then, that, that transcending all of that time, you know. Were the British managing the railway when, when you were with...? Uh, no, I joined the railways in '57, so uh, the Indian management had taken over. Hmm. But there were a few uh, Britishers. Mm -hmm. I remember Mr. Eddie Lamb, who was the chief mechanical engineer of the old BNR, the Southeastern, as it's called now. Mm -hmm. And there was a Mr. Young, who was the deputy general manager. Mm -hmm. But there were a lot of uh, Anglo-Indian foremen, supervisors, 
who had worked under the British management or on the verge of retirement. Right. And uh, they were still there mm. for a couple of years mm. while I was mm. working. Uh, the rot, uh, I would say the chain set in, mm. in the early 50s, you know, mm. or the later 50s to right. be exact, not yeah. the early 50s, say 58, mm. in the early 60s, when all these, uh, you know, complexes like religion, caste, right. regionalism, all these right. things came to the fore. Right. But uh, till then it was okay. Mm. So. You know, if, if I get uh, from, from the research and from talking with you earlier, really the Anglo-Indian worker transcended a lot of this separatist type uh, unionism and, you know, people coming from one state in India yes, and another, uh, some rivalry. I... Yeah, that's right. But, you know, it was good and uh, bad too because, mm. you know, the Anglo-Indian worker was a hard worker right. and... Uh, a loyal worker too, and I, that was the problem really. He was liked for his hard work, but when it came to, you know, showing empathy for the colleague, mm. you know, unionism, joining a union, joining mm. a strike, mm. that was strictly taboo. The Anglo-Indian wouldn't do that. He was too loyal to go against right. any boss. Okay. So uh, that's where there was a conflict between him and uh, his colleagues, his, his non-Anglo-Indian colleagues. Oh, okay. But for the Anglo-Indian supervisor and boss, it was quite good because they were considered impartial. Right. And, uh, you know, everyone liked them. The Bengalis liked them, the Bihari mm. liked them, mm. the Muslims liked them. Because, uh, you know, all were the same for him. Mm. All the different castes and yeah. were the same. Yeah. Well, you know, when I was in India in 2006, yes. I went to, to uh, a few workshops around India and spoke to elderly Indian men who'd worked with the Anglo-Indians yes. and they told me that you know they really enjoyed working with the Anglo-Indian. It was certainly uh, they never felt uh, debased or degraded or separate. It was everyone was there to do a job and everyone worked together well. Yes that was the case yeah. really. Yeah. Um, talking about unions and, and uh, loyalties something I've always uh, you know, and I'm still trying to research, is that the Anglo-Indians historically have not come across as, as political by any means compared to, say, the Hindus or the, or the Muslims. Not in a fanatical way, but just as an interested party. Um, and I was wondering, when independence came, this must have been a huge tug for the Anglo-Indian this separation of loyalty. Well, uh, you're right. You see, the Anglo-Indian didn't want to know anything about politics. The Anglo-Indian was uh, a product of the European soldier, you know. Mm. So a good soldier liked to do his uh, hard day's work and then he looked for his fun. Yeah. So he was non-political, or I would say apolitical. Mm. So politics was taboo. Right. But uh, in India, a good ten years after independence, you know, everything got politicized. Every right. issue mm. got politicized, and uh, it is here that the Anglo-Indian, you know, got the brunt of it because uh, he couldn't join in any of those things. It was not natural for him to oh, indulge okay. in any of right. those things. Yeah. Uh, that is changing now, mm. and there are Anglo-Indians now who do have political affiliations. Mm. 